Enjoy some beverages, some snacks in the back, and as you are waiting for the beginning of our panel tonight, I wanted to let you know there is a client profile or participant profile that we're asking that you fill out. Um, Mark is from the Geriatric Education Center, the South Texas Geriatric Education Center, and he is also videotaping us today. So um, the participant profile helps him with research and grant funding opportunities. So we're asking if you would be so kind to fill that out for us. And the way our setup is tonight is, is we wanted you to have the opportunity to ask the experts your questions. And so this is really based on, on the questions that you have. Um, I plan to go over a bio of each of our panelists and then give you the opportunity to write down your questions on that sheet of paper. And um, my name is Helen Flores. I'm with Caring Companions. We're one of the three sponsors for this function. I'll be your moderator tonight. So hang tight. We'll begin in a couple minutes. Well, good evening again. We are prepared to begin. Uh, my name is Helen Flores, as I mentioned earlier, and I want to introduce Vanna White from <laughs> the Forum at Lincoln Heights. I'm joking. This is my uh, co-sponsor. Christy Allen, she is the, our gracious host tonight for our function. Can't forget Mark over here from the South Tex Texas Geriatric Education Center. Thank you, Mark, for your help and participation. I want to welcome you to our second panel of experts. Um, and uh, fortunately, our panelists are all arrived and we're ready to begin. If you have not hit the cheese log in the back, <laughs> Please save me some if you do. I'm joking. Absolutely. So, Vanna over here is going to be my assistant. And those sheets that we were filling out previously for questions to the panelists, so we'll be collecting them throughout the night. But let me just say, we're quite informal. So, uh, feel free to raise your hands if, if there's a question you'd like me to address. So I'm excited to introduce our panel to you tonight because I've worked with many of these individuals um, on a, a, a close and not so close basis, a distant basis. Um, my colleague is here from Caring Companions, Brenda Pitts, and she uh, helped us organize this and, and said you've got to get Dr. Mark Nelson on your panel because, number one, he makes fun of my hair every time I'm working with him. <laughs> And number two, um, he, he would do an excellent job. And we, are, we know that there are age-related issues um, that come up in the form of arthritis, maybe some stenosis of the spine, maybe some uh, poor sport injury, repair work, so on and so forth. So as I go towards, um, I want to talk a little bit about the panels tonight. So our, my very far right, Dr. Mark Nelson is here. Dr. Nelson is board certified in rheumatology and in internal medicine. He earned a medical degree at the Medical College um, of Georgia after completing his undergraduate degree at Xavier University in Cincinnati, Ohio. His internal, uh, internal medicine internship and residency were completed at Brooks Army Medical Center and a rheumatology fellowship was performed at Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C. Following his training, Dr. Nelson was Chief of Rheumatology at William Beaumont Army Medical Center in El Paso. He has been in private practice in San Antonio since 1985. Dr. Nelson is a member of the Texas Medical Association, the Bear County Medical Association, and a fellow of the American College of Rheumatology. He's been in the medical he has been the medical director of Compass Hospice, a long-term acute care and rehab hospital since 1994. He's also listed in the Guide of Top Doctors and American's Guide to of Top Physicians, which lists the top-rated doctors in the country. So we are fortunate to have him tonight. And in 2005 through 2008, Dr. Nelson was named Texas Super Doctor in Rheumatology by the Texas Monthly Magazine. Welcome, Dr. Nelson. Our next panelist, I've had a fortunate opportunity to establish a relationship with her, her staff and as well as with herself. Dr. Sarah Dirks is here. She's the doctor of dental surgery 
Um, Dr. Derbs received her dental degree from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio in 1988. And she has a full-time practice in geriatric dentistry with an emphasis on medically compromised elderly patients. Uh, she served as the clinical director at the UT Health Science Center San Antonio Geriatric Dental Clinic prior to going into private practice. Dr. Dirks has patients from over 40 nursing facilities here in South Texas. Her patient, patient base is primarily from referring physicians and associated adjunct medical providers and caring companions. In fun, I will just say that we need to offer a, con a congratulatory because she just uh, had an open house celebrating her third year in private practice and um, also brought several colleagues on board, um, Dr. Galvan, as well as their wooing, Dr. Stacy Smith, to come on over <laughs> from the Health Science Center. So ladies, thank you for joining in the audience today, too. So I welcome you as well, Dr. Dirk. And just beyond Dr. Durst, or below Dr. Durst, I should say, is, is my pal Byron Cordes. Byron Cordes received a master's in social worker from the Warden School of Social Services at Our Lady of the Lake here in San Antonio, and has a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Oklahoma State University. No wonder you get along with my owner so well. He's from that other school. Ah, same, same neck of the woods. Byron has worked for over 20 years in the social working field, and his background includes medical social work, case management, clinical work with geriatrics. Byron is a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Texas. He also holds an advanced certification in, in social work case management from the National Association of Social Workers. He has served as an assistant professor at the Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio and continues to teach as an adjunct uh, faculty. faculty. Byron has had his writings published on geriatrics and caregiving. He currently owns and operates Sage Care Management, a professional geriatric care management agency, and provides case management outreach and support to seniors. He serves on the national board of the National Association of Professional Geriatric Case Managers and is past president for the South Central, uh, South Central, excuse me, South Central mm -hmm. Chapter of that organization. He is a member of the American Society on Aging and the National Association of Social Workers. Byron has been married for 21 years, although he doesn't look it, <laughs> and has one daughter. He's active with, active with several local community organizations to include his church. Welcome, Byron. And last, not least, to my immediate right is Candace Slusher, a wife, mother, and licensed nurse who's been providing compassionate care to the San Antonio senior community for over 15 years. She has extensive hands-on experience in geriatric health from skilled nursing, home health nursing, as well as assisted living management. For the last six years, Candace has worked as the administrator for us at Caring Companions, a non-medical home health agency where she gets everything she has learned um, for the benefits of her clients throughout all her experience. Candace has served on the board of the Alamo Area Home Care Council for four years and is currently the vice president of that organization. She is treasurer, and I will tell you, she got nominated and, and created that position on the basis that she's cute. <laughs> She is the treasurer and founding member of the Link SA networking organization and remains passionate about improving education to our seniors and those who care for them. So overall, may we have an applause for our prestigious panel? As you can tell, we have a lot of fun at work. You got to, right? So the moderator tonight, it was supposed to be our owner, Patrick O'Hare, and unfortunately, he was mandated by his in-laws to attend a football game tonight um, since they had come from out of town. So his son is playing, and his daughter is um, a rah-rah. What does she do? Dancer. Dancer um, at the same game. So I crucified him for not being here tonight because I told him our function was on his calendar much longer than the football schedule being out. But I uh, just wanted to mention that he's normally a part of this, this uh, panel of experts. So again, my name is Helen 
Florida. I was going to say Helen Burke. Ooh, that would have been a faux pas. I've been married for almost 16 years and uh, been in the geriatric business as well for about 13 of those years. So I see several of our clients here in the audience, some of our colleagues, and I welcome all of you. So we're pretty easy going. We really wanted to make this an opportunity for you to be able to get right at the experts. And so again, I'm going to start off reading some of the questions. Um, just make sure when you write your questions, let me know who they're directed to, okay? So my first question came in for Dr. Durst, and um, this is a great question. Dr. Durst, what a great way to start off our evening, and they, someone wants to know who your most memorable patient has been. Oh, oh wow. Uh, to be honest with you, almost all of our patients are memorable, aren't they? I mean, they really, really are. We call them leaves on a tree. Every, that's what I love so much about geriatrics is everybody's so unique. But um, I haven't seen Mrs. Townsend. Let me just give you an example in how many years. But when I saw her face, I instantly remembered her husband as being one of my patients because he was very memorable. And one of the reasons he was very memorable, if I may bring it up, is that he suffered from Parkinson's. As, as we were saying, sometimes nothing, everything does happen for a reason. I had just written a paper on Parkinson's. My mother was just diagnosed, diagnosed with Parkinson's. And then uh, it so happened Mrs. Townsend's husband came in for care. And uh, so he was definitely one of the top 10, uh, one of my most memorable patients. But honestly, all of them, uh, the second we see them, we're like, yeah, because of they're all you need. Could you explain the nature of your office? Because I know you are atypical from some of the other dental offices that I've been in. I, I would love to. Um, uh, our office is the only office I know of in San Antonio that's specifically set up for uh, elderly, medically compromised individuals, which means we have a wheelchair lift. So if you're in a wheelchair, you don't have to transfer out of your chair. We actually tilt you back. Our hallways are really wide, so if you're in an electric wheelchair, as Mr. Townsend was, you can maneuver around. And honestly, uh, uh, our, our, our whole setup is geared towards medically compromised. So if you're healthy, we, we don't know what to do. And we're so used to dealing with all those situations that most offices will throw a wrench in the day. Health throws a wrench in our day. Um, so we try to see a lot of patients that maybe wouldn't fit in in a regular practice. Thank you. Thank you. This next question, yes. I can hear because I'm sitting right here. Do I need to talk right louder? Next to the table, but can y'all hear? I'll talk louder. Air conditioner. Yeah. I can do that. Trust me. Okay. Yeah. Thank I'll you. I'll talk louder. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Dr. Nelson, this next question was addressed to you. And the um, audience wants to know, how does fibromyalgia patients increase their quality of life? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, fibromyalgia is a disease that uh, manifests itself by generalized pain. And uh, I think the first thing a fibromyalgia has to, do, it has to do is learn to live with their pain learn to control their pain by different methods. And we can do that with medication uh, to some degree, exercise to some degree, physical therapy, occasionally we give some cortisone shots and other modalities. Getting a good night's sleep is very important. Uh, making sure you don't have sleep apnea or a condition that's affecting your sleep, but sleep is very important. And basically what happens in fibromyalgia is that you're pain threshold gets reset and that things are painful for you that are not painful for the average person. So you have to learn how to deal with this pain uh, from a psychological standpoint and your physician can help you by a variety of modalities that we just talked about. I have found in my background of working in retirement communities that some of my patients have medicated their fibromyalgia with alcohol. And there were many times where we would have to pull bottles from the bathroom cupboard and underneath the bed and whatnot because this person was not living with their disease. I think just as you get older, you mean you're going to have more arthritis and more pain in general. And it's uh, as I get older myself, I'm having more aches and pains, and I can relate to some of the pain that y'all are having. But uh, 
Uh, but it is something that, yeah, sometimes people are over-medicated with fibromyalgia. We you know, try to avoid that if possible. Byron, now that we're talking about a little bit of uh, over-medication, Explain what a geriatric case manager can do. Um, I was thinking off the top of my head most recently, we were talking to you about a client who had over-medicated herself, yet wouldn't let her children participate in the med routine. And so explain where a geriatric case manager could come into play. Um, okay. A, a geriatric, and actually we call them geriatric care managers. Thank you. Uh, that's all right. Uh, we distinguish case managers typically look at clients as a case or they look at a file or their, their um, allegiance is to some agency. So we look at the entire care of the individual. Um, so as far as medications, you know, we can come in. It's amazing sometimes, you know, children can scream at their parents um, over and over again about, it, you know, I think, Mom, it would be helpful if you did this, it would be helpful if you did this, it would be helpful if you did this. All of a sudden, a social worker or a nurse comes in who's a geriatric care manager, and suddenly we're an expert. Hopefully we are, but we say the exact same thing as the son has said. And they thought, oh, okay, well, I can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so a care, a, a care manager can also come in, a nurse care manager, um, which we have, uh, can also come in and set up medications. They can monitor the medications. Um, fill medication boxes, work on medication reminders uh, to make sure that medications are being dispensed properly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this next question, I'm going to try to read their writing. Hint, hint, hint. Okay, it says, how often should dentures be cleaned by a dentist or hygienist? That's a good question, actually. I believe that would be directed to you, Dr. Durst. I have to answer that question. Um, I, think, I think that's an excellent question. Um, there's the, they, some people think that since they wear dentures, they don't have to brush them. But um, dentures should be cleaned, removed from the mouth, and cleaned after every meal. And what I've seen from what I've been doing over the years is even though some of my patients are on peg tubes or feeding tubes, and they actually aren't having food going through the mouth. They have more calculus, more buildup, more bacteria, and therefore more oral infections like candidiasis than people even with teeth. So just as often as if you have teeth, which would be after every meal. Is, is that because their saliva isn't? The, yeah, through exactly. Often. Saliva actually moves the bacteria through your GI system, and if you're not swallowing and everything just pools, it actually can create a lot of minerals and a lot of calculus, even though you're not eating. So by a hygienist or professional, yeah, that, that was too. that was the question, That's and okay. I think it depends on the on the person. But if most patients, because of dexterity issue, dexterity issues or an inability to get to a sink, I would say if you're in a facility and have some adaptive limitations, uh, every three months is a minimum. As a minimum. Helen, what does that entail? What does what would the dentist do that a high yeah, a normal person would do. Would you get in there and do something special to the dentures? Oh, well, some of our dentures, you cannot get it off without specialized equipment. Or like an ultrasonic cleaner that are, could cost hundreds of dollars, or we actually grind the calculus off. So you could, sometimes these dentures get so dirty that you cannot even get the material off. But the other thing is we actually decontaminate them because, as you know, elderly people are susceptible to oral candidiasis. So we have to actually kill that fungus, and a toothbrush won't do it. And that's like a yeast infection, yes, the oral yes. candidiasis? Correct. Okay. It bad on dentures. Okay. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I thought I saw that the brushing action is actually causing grooves and cracks in the dentures. Is that right or well, wrong? Well, maybe that there is some evidence for that years ago when denture teeth were less durable, but now with the last 20 years, that's not so much an issue, and you really have to have a headache. Not so much anymore. So no steel wool. No steel wool. Okay. <laughs> Just a soft toothbrush. Great. Thank you. Okay. Vanna, if 
there's any questions that people, folks, if you have your questions ready for me, um, Christy will come papers. by. More papers. More papers, too. Okay. Candace Slusher, Administrator of Caring Companions, in your 16 years of working with the geriatrics, um, are you finding that the elderly population may have an increase to falls, safety issues in the home, and if so, why? Anybody here exercise every single day like we're instructed to do? No. No. Really? Wow. I hate to have to call you a liar for yeah. now, but I will. Um, you said once a year, right? Once a year. That's yes. what, no, once that's not year. what I said. I know I don't. And uh, when you're young and healthy and your muscles and bones are where they're supposed to be and they're strong and they're holding on to each other, we can go a little longer without exercising and staying mobile before our muscles start to atrophy. But once you hit a certain point, and I'm not going to give you a number because it's different for everyone. Um, some of us it's 30, <laughs> some of us it's 55, some of us it's 70. But once you hit a certain point and you don't exercise and you don't stay as active as you know that you should, your, much will, your muscles will atrophy. And um, you know, if, if anyone here has ever been hospitalized for a certain period of time, even though you may have been relatively healthy from the beginning, if you stay in bed for a week, when you come out, you're weak. It takes a long time to recover from any kind of infection. If, if something's kept you in bed for a week, a good flu, it takes you, what, a month to recover. And we're all relatively healthy people. So you just have to be mindful that your muscles shrink very, very quickly, much more quickly, quickly than they will grow and, and develop. So um, as we're on the downside, and we're on the downhill, since once you're over the hill, literally, uh, you just have to stay as active as possible. And for some people, that's just um, walking out in the yard once a day, getting the mail every day, and uh, not relying on your neighbors to take out the trash, that kind of thing. What about safety issues in the home? What are some of the common fall issues related to safety? Clutter. Mm -hmm. Clutter is the biggest one. Mm -hmm. I want to clip that coupon in that newspaper before I throw it out. And three weeks later it goes by and you've collected 21 newspapers with 21 of the same coupon that you've never clipped out or used. And you have a stack of paper that's going to knock you down one day. It's, it's going to just reach right out and push you over when you're walking down your hall. Um, clutter is probably the, the biggest issue. Um, we collect furniture, we don't get rid of things, they have sentimental value, and a walkway, or in my case a walkway, is not necessarily enough. I mean, you need to be able to maneuver, you need to be able to turn around. At some point you just need to get rid of some of the furniture that you're not using. If you haven't taken the trinket off of this little tiny table in three years, guess what? It doesn't mean that much to you. <laughs> you should probably get rid of it. Um, I would say clutter and space problems are the biggest issue. Um, low vision, uh, your, your vision, what's the word, deteriorates. And uh, you may not see something, something that's on the ground. Um, depth perception will start to decrease. Uh, what else? Let me see. Lighting, uh, you've got it. When, once your vision starts to go a little bit. You need better lights in your home, not those nice little 25 watt yellow lights. You might need to increase that um, light a little bit. And I think those are the two biggest things. It's just just the lighting, I'll just, um, uh, seniors, as we age, what, less our, we, need, less light. No, we need more light. light. We, we need, need more light. We need more light. We're, our vision decreases by about one, one third in normal aging. So I don't know about most of you. I, when I hit 40, I think on my 40th birthday, I had to walk through my whole house and replace all those 40 watt bulbs with 60 watt bulbs. And now I'm staring at the 100 watt bulbs at Target, thinking that might not be enough. But we do need more light. Um, so certainly um, night lights, getting up falls in the evening on your way to the bathroom are, are probably one of the number one falls for seniors. Bathrooms, bedrooms, and kitchens are the biggest places for accidents. So. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't need to throw rugs on the floor that badly. If, if um, you're spilling water regularly, there might be you know, some other way to do that, but a throw rug will trip you in a heartbeat. Um, what 
else. You might want to rearrange your bedroom so that if you have a master bathroom in your bedroom, there's a, a, an easy straight shot from your side of the bed to get to the bathroom. Um, I, don't, I can't even tell you how many times I've gotten up at night to go to the bathroom and just dumped my toe. And, um, you know, so that can be detrimental. I had a question. Why, and as a former caregiver, I know the answer, but it might be a good explanation. Why are seniors fearful or res resist, what is it, they don't want to take a shower, they don't want to take a bath? Why are they so against that? I'm going to guess at this, but um, based on my experience, I have found that, that it just depends on everybody's bathing routine. You know, our seniors are not out perspiring every day like maybe uh, someone our age is. So the necessity to bathe every day may not be there. If we're dealing with some incontinence issues, then obviously we need to pay, pay closer attention to that. But also, um, some of our seniors didn't use showers. I mean, they're accustomed to doing a bath. And that's what their comfort level is. And bathing is one of the most private things that you can do besides going to the bathroom to eliminate. Um, and why would you want someone in the bathroom with you? So we know that, no, that this could cringe on independence, maybe be a little stressful for the person with, with need, support. And so there is that reluctance to bathing. But we have to pay attention to the, the daily routine, the needs of that individual. Are we dealing with incontinence issues? Do we have wound care problems? And you know, maybe bathing three times a week is just appropriate. It, it depends. So it varies. But we also see in dementia cases that you know having that that bead of water shouting out onto their face is very fearful and frightening to them. And sometimes I do have something to add. Sometimes it's a matter of control. Because just like well, basically when you don't have control over anything else, you can say no when there's something you don't want to do. Because most likely if I want my grandmother to take a bath and she says no, I'm not going to pick her up and throw her in the tub. Right? She's going to win that because she put her foot down. And she suddenly just took control back of that situation from me. And when she's lived her entire life making decisions for anything for kids and running a dairy and a teacher for 42 years, I've got no business telling her what to do. And sometimes it's just about taking back control. So being mindful of a person's attachment to their independence is very important in many aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nelson, this next uh, question came in and it's going back to the fibromyalgia comment. Why does fibromyalgia develop into Raynaud's? Reynolds? Reynolds? Oh, Reynolds. Reynolds? Or show signs of scleroderma? Um, you know, really, fibromyalgia and scleroderma are two totally separate diseases and there is no real association. Patients with some other rheumatic conditions will develop secondary fibromyalgia. Scleroderma is a kind of a horrible disease where you get this fibrosing skin condition. Your skin gets real taut and tight and height bound. And uh, the only good thing about it is that you don't show your wrinkles as much. So people with scleroderma actually look younger even though their skin is pretty tight. They don't need a facelift. But, uh, and sometimes when you have a, a, you know, a chronic condition, a chronic like even rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or one of these other more severe rheumatic conditions, you'll get a secondary fibromyalgia. And again, fibromyalgia is your pain threshold is set lower, so things that are and not normally painful for the average individual would be painful for you. So there's really no association, but any chronic illness, it's not too uncommon to see fibromyalgia kind of set in, uh, you know, whether it be um, any chronic illness from heart failure to you know, any, any other chronic condition, but, but scleroderma and fibromyalgia are two totally separate conditions. One thing that came to mind as you were discussing that, Dr. Nelson, is um, my father had stenosis of the spine, and he had 
challenges with back pain for a majority of his adult life. Could you explain to people what stenosis of the spine is? Yeah, well, spinal stenosis is where the spinal canal, where the nerves come down, uh, that canal becomes narrowed. It becomes narrowed for several different reasons. One, you know, you have the vertebral body, so you have, you know, kind of bones that are separated by discs. And we've all know, heard that you, when you herniate your disc, you know, it causes problems, and that can pinch one of these nerves that are coming out at each level. When you get stenosis, what happens is the, the disc kind of degenerates and tends to herniate or go into the spinal canal. And then what happens is when these discs degenerate, you have these little things called facet joints on each side of the vertebral body. And these facet joints have a lot more, the, the disc is kind of like a shock absorber. And you lose that shock absorber and the body tries to heal itself and it forms these spurs in the facet joints and then on the edge of the vertebral body. And like many reparative process in the body, sometimes that process causes more problems uh, than the original problem it's trying to heal itself from. But, but all these things come together and the spinal canal gets very narrow and there's not enough space for these nerves to be in the bottom part of the spinal canal. And so what happens with that, you walk a certain distance and you have to sit down. And for some people, that'll be a block. Some people with really bad spinal stenosis, it'll be, um, you know, 50 feet. And, you know, sometimes we have to have, you know, surgery is sometimes for spinal stenosis. If some people will have multiple levels involved. So if you have one level involved, it's pretty easy to fix that surgically. If you have multiple levels involved, it's, it's very hard to fix that. You know, we give cortisone shots and some things that we can give people temporary relief for two to three months. And I do that a lot in my practice where people have spinal stenosis and they're going on a cruise and they want their back injected to get them through their vacation and cruise. And it helps quite a bit. It doesn't cure the problem. And, you know, it lasts in general for two or three months and then they might need something like that done again occasionally. You don't want to do that too often because it's like anything in life, too much of a good thing is usually not good for you, and too much cortisone isn't good for you. But, but uh, spinal stenosis is a very common problem, and it, as you get older, it becomes more and more of a problem. Thank you. Dr. Dirks, it says, are there dental, Im are, are dental implants a viable treatment alternative? Yeah, I would, I would, that reminds me of another favorite patient I have. We had a patient probably three months ago who was 103 and got dental implants. So we think he may make the Guinness Book of World Record, Records. And uh, dental implants not only are a viable implant, I think they're the standard of care. And I know when I was in dental school in the 80s, implants were the exotic thing. Implants are really becoming so much more bread and butter, and it will actually change a person's life who wears dentures, who cannot keep their dentures in their mouth that can be now attached to implants. So I would say definitely for patients who have dentures and have had dentures for years and years and years and years, to be able to snap the denture on even as little as two implants can change your life. So absolutely. And I always ask my patients, how was it? How was it? Oh, that wasn't as bad as getting my teeth cleaned, right? They never complained that it was a bad experience. So I was just thinking of those individuals who typically either gain weight or lose weight due to an illness um, mm -hmm. either way, and the dentures don't fit anymore. So this could be a resolvable situation. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. It's not the sexy stuff it used to be. I mean, it's, it's routine bread and butter, what we all should be looking at as an alternative for us now. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Nelson, this is, well, it's actually to Dr. Dirks and Dr. Nelson. What do you do for fun when you're working with geriatric patients? Go first. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good uh, question. You know, I think just uh, being with people and interacting with people is what makes medicine fun. I mean, I just think, you know, I enjoy seeing patients trying to make them better, trying to figure out what's wrong with them. And over a period of time, you know, the, your patients become your friends, basically. And, uh, um, and we actually joke around, and it was interesting. Uh, 
give you this little side story. Yesterday in our office, I had one of my patients, had this, she's an elderly lady, probably in her early 80s, has horrible rheumatoid arthritis, and we have this drug called Rituxan. And you, it's actually a drug that's a, it kills B cells. It, it's an antibody against B cells, and B cells are your antibody forming cells, and it's used for lymphomas, and it was actually developed as a, uh, a drug for lymphoma and some types of leukemias, and we found it to be very effective in rheumatoid arthritis. But anyway, we were uh, infusing this drug. This patient of mine, um, her uh, daughter is Cheryl Ladd, and Cheryl Ladd, the movie star, she was one of Charlie's Angels, and uh, she was actually in our office uh, uh, the whole day with her mom during the infusion. It was pretty boring for her because she's there, you know, with nothing to do, and she's out talking to everybody. And, our priest happened to be over for dinner Friday night. We actually just happened to tell him that Cheryl Ladd was coming. He kind of invited himself to the office. <laughs> came over to get her autograph and kind of... He wanted to say a prayer for her. And kind of insisted on a picture with him. And she said, the autograph is fine, but I really don't want the picture taken. But he was very uh, persistent, so to speak. And she actually uh, acquiesced and uh, he got a picture. I think I speak for many of us males who say we'd be happy to come also. Yeah. Anyway, it was, you know, she actually spruced up. But it's, it's just kind of things like that. I mean, just interacting with people and kind of having fun. And, uh, I think Cheryl Ladd looks like her mother, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, no? No? Yeah. No? Actually, oh, it must be another movie star I was thinking. Cheryl Ladd is, uh, is extremely good looking. <laughs> Did you get a picture with her? I did not get it. I was too busy. I was, you know, Wednesdays, Wednesdays we infuse and we, you know, we have a bunch of people getting infusions. I'm seeing other patients. And, um, I did talk to her a little bit. And, uh, she's actually trying to move to San Antonio. She's having trouble selling her house. Like, uh, some, like almost everybody is that has to sell their house. But anyway, she's, she's going to be our neighbor here pretty soon. And Dr. Derps? I can't top that, but um, all of us who work with the elderly, we truly, truly, you know this, love it. Because pe it, people are so unique. And I think the longer we're on this earth, the more unique we are. And it's just so, so rewarding for me to get to know these people and talk to them. And it, it, it's hard to describe, but I would say every single person, even the ones that are difficult, they're still in their own way, just very, very fun. It's fun. We have a lot of fun. They're the ones us. that are challenging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not the easy ones. They're not, they're not quite as much fun as the ones that are challenging. Yeah. Well, we have a client at Caring Companions who we've been with for about seven years. And this particular client used to date Clark Gable. And so when we would go visit, or when we go visit, every time, every time we have to be dressed for tea and don't even show up in a pair of slacks. Yeah. And so we know when we do that supervisory visit, we need to make sure we're there for a good an hour or two or we will offend her. But all over her apartment is memorabilia of when they dated for, how long did they date? I can't recall. It was only about six months, but they took a lot of pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's wow. She said he was um, more boring than one might think. <laughs> Really? Well, for her? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. How can I encourage uh, my loved one to brush their teeth? What are some motivation tactics? All of the above on the panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of us. Because y'all have to encourage, too. Ice I mean, cream I after it, brushing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can do it on a professional level, but it really starts with the hands-on caregivers and the hands-on people, because I just see you just try to fix things. So, you know, hand, hand them the tooth, give them a tool saying, they think, can use. Yeah, like, mom, sometimes maybe a, a dental professional, like a hygienist or a dentist, can give you the tools. There's a lot of tools out there that, for us, are routine that maybe the average person doesn't know about. And to give them something, because you're right, people want independence. Maybe because of arthritis, they can't hold the toothbrush. There's some very simple economical solutions and maybe you just need the dentist to give them something they can hold. Because they do, it's just getting to, they want to do it. 
So I would think, first of all, giving them the tools and encouraging that way. Well, and it's probably been a part of their entire lives, mm -hmm. obviously, if they still have any teeth, especially. And uh, it, again, you're right, it's not that they're necessarily resistant. So in, in the caregiving environment, we may want to find out what is the objection. Why don't you want to brush your teeth? And then try or to the obstacles. It. Yes, I, th I think that's obstacles. Obstacles. well. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I think sometimes yeah. it's a little combination of both. Right. Obstacles and um, maybe their gums obstinance. hurt, and they mm -hmm. haven't told us. You know, maybe mm -hmm. there's pain involved that we don't know about. Maybe they're afraid of choking because a, a couple of months ago when they brushed their teeth, they choked on the toothpaste. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's most likely a reason why. And there's and other things you can use now instead of toothpaste, which has to be spit out. And I think one of the key things, if you don't have the regular care, your gums get sore. And I always tell them, like, it's like when my kids were little and they skin their knee and you want to scrub it, it hurts. So when you get in there with the toothbrush, it really hurts. So you, they really need to see their dentist, get their mouth back into health, and then the daily care is a lot easier. Because our, like, for example, our Alzheimer's patients, when we get their gums back to health, they love to have their teeth brushed. You'll put that toothbrush in there, they'll suck on it, they don't want to give it up. So once they're healthy, it's really a good stimulation. So there's a reason they're resisting, and it's probably because of pain, rather than, yeah, because it's a pleasant experience for and, most. And for some, you can always threaten to send them to the dentist Dentists. if they don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes that would be a good motivator. So the adaptive equipment that you were referring to, like say if someone has fine motor skill problems, um, they have like special handled yeah, toothbrushes. Like phones, yeah, we get these foam things that we get at Home Depot that we stick on there. We test their grip strength. There are certain mouth rinses now that are watery, and if they wanted to drink the whole thing, it's not poison. Toothbrush isn't real. Toothpaste isn't always the best thing for someone who's not inclined to spit. They've had a stroke. Now some of our patients can't swish and spit. So what do you do? You're not going to want to put toothpaste in there, so you have to be realistic. So there's other things. For caregivers, there's mouth props. If you have uh, Parkinson's disease or stroke, you may need a prop in there. You can get foam props that you can torque gently and brush. So basic things that are economical can really make a difficult task much easier. Again, I think this next question can go to me. Yes. What is this mouth prop? Well, it's. I wish we would have brought one. It's a foam prop made out of firm foam, and I use it a lot with my Alzheimer's and Parkinson patients. You put it in sideways, and then it's got little ridges, and you just turn it, and that way their mouth is open. Because you know, with something, some illnesses, you clench down or you won't open. And it's just a way for maybe spouses or caregivers to then get in there to brush the teeth. Just a foam prop. And a dental supply company has them, uh, so we distribute those to our patients whose, care, whose spouses have to take care of the teeth of caregivers. Now we distribute them to the nursing facilities too. Uh, again, I think this next question can go to the entire panel, and it says, is there a special diet to follow or recommended for arthritis patients? Uh, that, that question comes up all the time, and there is really no proven diet that is... We do know some diets are better. You know, actually a diet that is high in omega-3 fatty acids is... Uh, helpful for arthritis, a, a high fat, high cholesterol diet in general is probably not the best diet for arthritis, but there's been no specific diet that's been proven to uh, actually improve arthritis. But you know, omega-3 fatty acids is, you know, they have a, a it does have an anti-inflammatory uh, effect. It's a, it's kind of the same as taking an, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory does some of the same, has some of the same anti-inflammatory properties. It requires a fairly high dose of omega-3s to get that effect. But, but in general, there's no specific diet that's going to, I mean, there's a lot of claims, different diets, and there's a lot of um, uh, kind of misinformation out there and a lot of claims for different diets and things uh, curing arthritis, but it's not 
really true. So there's no really specific, mainly a healthy diet, which is, you know, is good for arthritis. And kind of a low fat, low cholesterol, high in uh, omega-3 fatty acids is a pretty healthy diet. Kind of the Mediterranean diet. Thank you. Is there an increase in cavities in the elderly population, and why? Oh, that's a great question. I'm glad. Who asked that question? I think they should get the prize. That's a great question. Okay. Um, because that what what I see a lot with my aging patients who've taken care of their teeth all their life, they may have gotten crowns 40 years ago. And how long do crowns last? You know, maybe 10, maybe 15 years. So as the if they I see patients take care of their mouths and then they're really shocked when they come to the dentist and they have 40 cavities. Well, where'd that come from? Well, crowns don't last forever, and then you couple that with the number one side effect of medications, which is dry mouth, and you cut that dry mouth thing causes the bacteria to stick to your teeth. Because normally saliva washes that bacteria down your stomach and it kills it, so the bacteria sticks to your teeth. You have crowns that are aging, and your mouth can go from relative health to 25 cavities in a matter of a year. So that's one of the reasons as we age we're at higher risk. Dry mouth and old failing restorations that need to be redone. And medications. And, well, medications that cause the dry yeah. mouth. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that question. Sure. Um, Candace and Byron, what is the biggest factor that you find um, causes someone from moving out of the home? What's the biggest? Factor that is causing for someone having to move out of the home. The biggest factor that would cause somebody to have to move out of the home. It, um, I mean, I'm going to say safety uh, is, uh, and safety is a big, broad, not just falls, but um, wandering, uh, being able to take care of themselves safely. Um, I will tell you, we we always talk about level of care and so lots of healthcare professionals talk about level of care as if it's that's the place um, so a nursing home is a level of care an assisted living is a level of care um, I like to use the term level of care to mean the amount of care that you need so I mean a, the level of care you need someone with you 24 hours a day because you're not safe ever by yourself so then some folks say, oh, so I have to go to a nursing home. Well, no, if you have enough money, you can do it at home. Um, level of, there's level of care, and then there's locus of care, where that care will happen. So the biggest cause, the, the truly only cause for someone having to move out of their home is not being able to take care of themselves physically or financially, and those two typically are really linked, um, in their own home. I know when my parents moved out of their home, um, my father couldn't mow the grass anymore. My mother had cooked for 10 people for most of her adult life, and she didn't want to do it anymore. And that's when she went into independent living retirement. So that was their catalyst. And just to sort of, if it's okay, to sort of give you a, a roundabout of, of the cost factor that you're looking at, um, if you need someone with you around the clock, you can live in a facility, such as this lovely facility here, anywhere from three to $4,500 a month, $3,000 to $4,500 a month. You can have someone at home with you for anywhere from seven to $11,000 a month. That's a really big jump. But when you're looking at 24-hour care, that's what you're looking at. And a lot it's of also times, the, the type of care that you need. The type of care. Well, that's that's kind of the big... Uh, right, you know, right. That's where the gap this, comes the, in. That's where the gap yeah. comes in. Um, but no one ever has to leave home if you have everything that you ever wanted. You know, if you've got the money you needed, you can stay. But that's why there's so many of these facilities coming up all over the place. The need is growing, and it's just more cost-effective. So. But you have options. 
We have an intern uh, doing his internship with us at Caring Companions. His undergraduate degree is in health education from the UT San Antonio location. And one of the projects that Candace has given him is to determine is it really the baby boomers coming of age, elder age issues, going to be that big boom that we're expecting in healthcare, or are our baby boomers healthier, living longer, and not needing health-related issues until their 80s, 90s, and 100? We don't know the answer yet. To that, sure, and I and that we always hear that we're living longer, healthier, and that's true, but we're also living longer, unhealthier. Used to be, grandpa had a heart attack at 65 and passed away. Now, when you're 90, I have patients on their third coronary artery bypass graft, they're having it redone, so we're just living longer, healthier, and unhealthier. That's Okay, I've exhausted the questions that were handed to me. Um, yes, sir. Oh, Vanna, you're sitting down on your job. <laughs> I realized I got a question in the audience. Here I come. Anyone? Thank you. Does anybody need any more of these little papers? Does a question come to your mind? Do you have one? This Perfect. is a great question. I'm glad. Dr. Nelson, this is geared to you, but I think um, our panelists can, can join in. Several questions, but the first one is how effective is glucosamine chondroitin in preventing joint degeneration in the aging baby boomer population? Well, there was there's been several studies done by the manufacturers of glucosamine and chondroitin that have shown that it can actually slow the progression of arthritis in your knees. And the way they do that when on the knee x-ray, you can see the bones, you don't see the cartilage. The cartilage is a black spot. When the cartilage wears out, the, the space where in between the bones narrows, and we measure it in millimeters. And there was a couple studies that showed that taking glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate could slow that progression. And there was a, a couple studies that looked fairly promising, and that's the main studies that uh, the drug companies have used to promote their products. Now the NIH just did a big study and found this is you know this was a kind of an unbiased study and they found it to be marginally effective. So not quite as effective as the companies that are that have some profit to gain by you know manufacturing the drugs. But I think it does and it actually besides whether it actually is a disease modifying drug and slows progression, it does help pain. And many people find it helpful. Uh, I, I do think it is beneficial. I, I don't, you know, know whether it's a disease. Like in rheumatoid arthritis, we have all these drugs that these new biologic drugs that slow progression of disease, prevent joint damage, and you know, are really we have ex extremely good proof that these drugs actually prevent deformities and prevent joint damage. In osteoarthritis, the studies we don't really have any good good disease-modifying drugs, any drugs that we're, we're sure that it slows progression of disease. But I do think glucosamine chondroitin is a good product. It provides pretty good symptomatic relief. It's safe, doesn't have a lot of side effects, very few, drug, no, no real drug interactions. And I think it is somewhat helpful, um, you know, whether it actually slows progression of disease, I think, is a little controversial and it's certainly not really proven. So the second question, which I think you've already answered, is, is it helpful in a joint that has already extensive degeneration? You know, it, it becomes less helpful, and, and, you know, when you have, you know, sometimes, like in rheumatoid arthritis, people are taking five or six drugs for their rheumatoid arthritis, and they want to know if, and, you know, glucosamine chondroitin doesn't decrease inflammation, and uh, I think, and, you know, I always tell, you know, they're taking a lot of stuff, and, you know, it's another drug to be taking, and I think it, in, in that situation it's probably not going to add a whole lot. But I do think people that have moderate osteoarthritis, I think it does provide some symptomatic relief, and it is a helpful adjunct. And I think one of the key things is that it doesn't have a lot of side effects. We're finding out more and more that some of the drugs that we've used for years, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, you know, we do they cause ulcers and 
can sometimes cause edema, raise blood pressure a little bit. But you know, there's there is some cardiovascular risk that's come to light recently with you know, there's a drug on the market and probably quite a few people in this room have taken Vioxx in the past and that drug was taken off the market because of uh, increased cardiovascular risk. Uh, it's kind of a shame it was taken off because it was actually a very good drug and the right individuals. It was it, it was a very effective medication, but um, but there was some you know if you had bypass surgery or you know you had a significant heart problem, heart failure, it wasn't the kind of medicine you should be on. But, uh, but there was there certainly was a place for that drug. What about fish oil? Well, fish oil is omega-3 fatty acids, and it does have an anti-inflammatory effect. It's good for you on many levels. It has an anti-platelet effect. It thins your blood. It prevents heart attacks and strokes. It lowers your cholesterol a little bit. It's very good at lowering your triglyceride, and it has an anti-inflammatory effect. So, you know, of all the dietary supplements out there, you know, omega-3 fatty acids and fish oil, flaxseed oil, uh, those products are very good. I mean, there are, you know, there's a lot of dietary supplements out there that there's really no proof that they do anything, and, you know, they're promoted pretty heavily. Omega-3 fatty acids are one that really do have some benefits on a lot of different levels. Um, you know, glucosamine and chondroitin, I think, is helpful, but not quite to probably to the degree, because, you know, omega-3 fatty acids is, is killing, you know, two or three birds with one stone, right? This is a question I have. Please help me understand the difference between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, osteoarthritis is a condition where the cartilage wears out. It appears to be a primary cartilage condition. For whatever reason, the cartilage is damaged. And then the bone uh, you know, tries to heal itself and forms spurs. And, and you know, eventually, the cartilage wears completely. Cartilage is a uh, tissue that doesn't regenerate very well. And we're, you know, actually, there's uh, a platelet-rich plasma. There's several different things coming on that you know that have that we're hoping to be able to regenerate cartilage somewhere down the line. If we can do it for if you have a small osteochondral defect, say a healthy knee that you injure it and you have a little defect in the cartilage, you can actually. Uh, put some cartilage in there and it can repair itself. But if you have a you know completely degenerated joint where the cartilage is completely um, gone, you really there's we haven't developed a good technique for doing that. But, um, uh, the cartilage in joints is a little different than other types of cartilage. It's called hyaline cartilage, and you know sometimes when it wears and we try to repair itself, we we form this fibrocartilage more like a tendon cartilage, and it isn't quite as good uh, in the joint. Uh, so osteoarthritis is more of a, it's, it's kind of a wear and tear condition, the cartilage wears. Where rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory condition, the cartilage is fine, but there's a, it's an autoimmune phenomenon where normally your immune system, for instance, you get a viral infection, you make antibodies against it, you get rid of the virus and the immune system shuts off. We have a, you know, our immune system is regulated, so when it's not needed anymore, it kind of shuts off. Or in rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system gets geared up, it gets revved up, and it doesn't shut off. And there's something in the joint that keeps this going, and you get this chronic inflammation. And that inflammation actually damages the cartilage, and then you get secondary osteoarthritis where that cartilage gets damaged. So it's a totally different process. So we treat rheumatoid arthritis by turning off the immune system. And we have a variety of different medications that work at different levels to do that. Uh, so it's you know it's a, it's a condition that nowadays we have really good, quite good treatment for it. And it's the unusual patient that we can't get it under control. So if you turn off the immune system, does that mean that that patient is at higher risk for regular infection? We do. We don't turn the immune system completely off. Uh, the medicines we use are immunosuppressive to some degree, and there is some risk of infection. Um, it, the risk is usually pretty manageable. You know, they, there is some 
risk and occasionally we see an opportunistic infection. Or these new uh, tumor necrosis factor drugs, the Enbrel's Remicades, mm -hmm. uh, we've had a, a little bit of a problem with reactivation of TB and we, we screen people for TB before we give the drugs. And, um, I've had one patient that had a reactivation of TB and then we actually knew he had a positive skin test. We had him on medicine to prevent reactivation, but it happened anyway and it affected the spine. It was a pretty bad complication, but he's recovered pretty nicely from it. But, but it, in general, the medicines are relatively safe, and the infection rate is relatively low for serious infections. Thank you. If your finger on your hand is bent or stiff, do you need medication? Um, how do you repair it? What are the side effects? You know, I, I, sometimes, you know, your fingers will be stiff, you'll lose a little bit of motion. Um, that doesn't necessarily need to be treated. You know, you want to what, put your joints through a range of motion every day and keep, you know, range of motion uh, in your joints. You know, the anti, you know, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are very effective in decreasing pain and inflammation in these joints that have osteoarthritis in them and can help maintain motion. Um, and occasionally, if we have just one joint involved, we'll put a cortisone shot in that joint. That's a very effective way. The medicine goes right into the joint. You don't have all the systemic side effects that you have with taking, you know, non anti-inflammatory agents. Um, you know, the, again, we talked a little bit about cartilage. You know, it has a limited ability to repair itself. And, you know, that's one of the big pushes, we're trying to find a disease modifying drug for osteoarthritis, something that helps. You know, early on when you get osteoarthritis in an early phase, if we could find a drug that would turn that cartilage damaging process off and let the cartilage repair itself, that would be the ideal way to treat that. But it's, been, it's been something that hasn't been an easy, uh, easy egg to crack, it hasn't, and we haven't really found anything that's that promising. I do think, you know, cartilage transplantation may be something in the future that uh, uh, I think there is some promise that that may be able to be developed in the future. <coughs> I had a question here that says, uh, what are some preferred activities for residents with dementia, um, Alzheimer's disease in general? Take it away. Okay. That depends. <laughs> that depends. <laughs> that depends on um, the stage of Alzheimer's disease or dementia that the particular resident or client is in. It depends on where they are in their mind, time-wise, where they are today. Um, a variety of activities, you know, you're going to have to have a whole a whole gamut. It could be reminiscing with pictures, with old newspaper paper articles, um, with music. Music is reaches everyone. You know, music is our universal language, um, aside from math. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know where I, I'm sorry. I have a teenager now, so I'm, I'm I think differently. Um, what else? What else? Uh, something organized and short, maybe anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes long, and that, that's probably the maximum that you're going to be able to hold someone's attention who's got um, a significant stage of dementia. What else? No, I think you nailed it. It really depends on where they are and what day it is, because if they're having a great lucid day, maybe they will be able to follow a recipe and enjoy cooking like they once did. Or maybe they do remember um, the procedures in mass or going to church and they would benefit from that. But on a day that is not so lucid and clear, then sometimes we just have to cope through those days and see what works. And what works one day may not work the next day. And so that's the struggle that our caregivers and companions have um, 
whether you're with an agency or caring for your loved one, because you never know what kind of day you're going to have. So I would recommend that you use a variety of um, interests, you know, getting a, a background. We try to work very hard on getting a social history or a background on our clients so that we know what they like. I, I could care less about golf, but golf was something my father was into. You could talk golf with him 24-7. So in order for me to have something interesting to do with him, I had to learn about the game. Now, I chose to drive the golf carts and get the hamburgers on the 19th hole. He chose to play. <laughs> so it's just finding out those interests that are still interesting to someone. I married someone who could care less about the NFL. And I am so happy about that. But, um, you know, there are people that wait around for the NFL season. So teaches them. Learning what they like, what they dislike, and what works today may not necessarily work tomorrow. I, I think the important thing is to always make sure that you're setting the person up to be successful. Because it's so easy to fail, isn't it? Sure. And, um, you know, if you have someone who has to have help, again, you're back to kind of independence, you always want to give them a task in front of them that you know they can do. Give them one step at a time for directions. If you're making a cake, you don't hand someone a bowl and some eggs and a recipe. You get out the bowl with them. You grab the spoon. You try and get them to help you crack an egg. One thing at a time. You fill the water half a cup. You hand it to them to pour it in. One thing at a time. And that's really important is just to be successful. Um, if they're successful in as many tasks as possible throughout the day, then your day will be successful, and that's important. And back to what Helen said, though, finding out what people like or are interested in, the converse to that is making sure you know what they don't care for. And so you know, we, we often see folks who, um, you know, the family will come to us and say, you know, my mother's in a facility, she won't come out of her room, she won't go to bingo, she won't go to the horse races, she won't go to, you know, the, the service. And so that social history that you alluded to is very important. Well, what did she like to do before? Oh, she hated people. Well, then why are you trying to make her a social animal now? So, but finding what they like and keeping it simple, keeping it very, very simple, you can't make it too simple. Right. They'll let you know when they want more. It's very hard if you make it too difficult to back off. You just you end up frustrating them. And be willing to give up. Um, if, a, if, a, if you're doing one simple task, be willing to throw that cake away. Um, because they've left the eggshells in there. But that's okay. They baked the cake that tastes like garbage. But they did it. We have this wonderful panel. Are there any other questions? We still have them for 30 more minutes, and I'm going to take it. <laughs> yes, Todd. I have a question about the fish oil. Aren't there side effects from taking all that fish oil? Like that? You stink. Yeah. Is there, is there, work, yeah. is there one that you prefer over the others? That, uh, you know, there's. Uh, you know, there is a uh, actually a prescription mm -hmm. that you know what you're getting when you get the prescription of you know, Lovasa. It's, it's kind of an expensive way of taking fish oil, but it's a, a very effective uh, product. You know, Amway has fish oil products with Dr. Whitney, who's kind of one of the cardio, kind of a, one of the cholesterol experts in San Antonio, like to use. He said the quality in the Amway fish oil was good. Um, you know, there's, there's a pretty rescue. Products have a lot of you know, fish oil. You know, there's, and there's some other dietary stuff. You know, like there's a, you know, niacin is a very good cholesterol medication. It's, a, it's one of the, it's one of the ideals. Just a lot of people can't take it; it causes flushing. I take it myself. But, you know, niacin is an extremely good, good loading. It really lowers your, you know, cholesterol. Raises your good cholesterol. Lowers the bad cholesterol. You know, it's the ideal drug if you can take it. And it's a lot of data, a lot older data, kind of proving that it prevents heart attacks and strokes like the staph drugs, but it doesn't seem to affect muscles as much. But, but, yeah, uh, but you know, 
the omega-3 fatty acids, there are just so many different omega-3s out there. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's mainly the dose of it. You, know, you have to take the recommended amount. you got to get a gram. It's kind of a little bit too complicated to go in, but it's a DHA, a DCA, it's the icosapatoic acid, dexo, hexosapatoic acid or something. Because those are the two main <laughs> omega-3 fatty acids that are really beneficial. But, uh, How difficult is it to find those sources in our regular diet? I mean, um, if you can salmon, you know, I mean, olive oil, and cold water fish, but, you know, it's in general, I don't think people get quite enough of in their diet. The day you eat salmon, you don't need your omega 3s. Uh, I don't think too many people eat salmon three or four times a week. But. Actually, um, one of the questions I just received is omega 3 fish oils full of purines? Purines? Uh, no, because it's fat. Purines are mainly protein. Okay. Uh, I think this will go to you as well, Dr. Nelson. It says, what are your thoughts on a patient that has to follow both a, ga a gout diet and a low cholesterol diet? You know, in general with gout, we give people medicine, and I tell them not to worry too much about their diet. I can control them their gas. So we actually have a new medication out for gout now. It's very healthy, so I don't... You know, there are, I mean, alcohol is the big thing with gout, you know, with alcohol decreases uric acid excretion, so, but even that, you know, I mean, I don't think people have to totally give up alcohol, you know, if you want a couple beers when you're watching the Cowboys on Sunday or whatever, you know, I'm not going to take that away from somebody, I think we can control the gout, but, and then, you know, any, you know, things, things with yeast and organ meats have a lot of uric acid in it, but, you know, in general, we can, if the patients are able to take medicine, we can control we control their gout, you know, pretty much I think with medication most of the time. Thank you. Anything else? Is there a topic that we haven't addressed yet? Um, I know Dr. Durst, my own mind, I was thinking about something, how oral hygiene can cause, or the lack of oral hygiene could cause some kind of chronic health crisis. Yeah, it, could you yeah. approach that? Yeah, I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Uh, uh, the, the, the mouth is a incubator for bacteria. And with gum disease being so common as we age, and when you have gum disease, the bacteria can actually will get into your bloodstream, and there's more evidence to show, and it's not real clear, but that that, that link with inf inflammatory products and with uh, uh, even like aspiration of bacteria in your lungs, that um, um, there's definitely, they say that the mouth is the window to your overall health. Um, you know, just to show you examples now that we're seeing, and we have a hospital dentist here, Dr. Galvan, who's one of my associates. We are in a position now where patients that are getting ready to have some sort of surgery need dental clearance from their dentist because the physicians, maybe a cardiologist, wants to make sure there's no oral infection active in the mouth that then can cause a potential infection in some new surgical site that hasn't Especially healed. Especially joint replacements. Oh, joint, yeah, joint, joint replacements, replacement thank you. one thing we really do like a good dental exam before we have Exactly. Because that's one of the, when you get an infection in an artificial joint, it is it's a major, terrible. major problem. Terrible, terrible. And, and thank you for bringing that up. And a lot of our patients have artificial joints, and before they even get their mouth cleaned, we have to put them on an antibiotic by recommendation of their physician. We actually had a couple clients that before they went to um, have their teeth cleaned, there was um, automatically an antibiotic that they would put on. Do you remember, mm -hmm. Mr. Bill? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the mouth is the gateway to infection in your body. Can, Would that it be can a, be. Can be. It can be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Going once. 
Yes, sir. So taking a mouth swab, wouldn't that be more cost effective than, than having a have a professional clear a patient? Or or does that not cover all spectrums of what could be in the mouth prior to surgery? Everybody, I mean, everybody yeah. has bacteria in your mouth. You, yeah. you, want, you don't want an abscess tooth. Or, I mean, everybody has bacteria in your mouth. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to swab your mouth, you're going to... Now, we are actually screening people more now for MRSA. You know, MRSA is the resistant staph. Staph is a bacteria that's on the skin. It's everywhere. And, you know, I mean, a lot of times you will see this in the hospital. People will have a sign on their door that they have MRSA and you have to wear a gown and a mask. And, and people think, boy, and people aren't even sick. And they, you know, they're, they're just colonized with it. Um, but staph, you know, if, if you're getting an artificial joint or if you're having back surgery now, some, a, lot of, a lot of the surgeons are asking to screen your patients for MRSA just so, just so they know that they're colonized with it. And if they are colonized with it, you know, we give uh, an ointment in your uh, nasal cavity to try to eliminate that colonization with it. Um, but that is becoming something that we're doing now. The staph can cause bad infections. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is something that if you're colonized with it, you get an infection, it's more, it's more likely to be that resistant staph. Thank you. Okay, well this is the time that we want to uh, thank you and thank our panel for coming tonight. Before we go, we have a couple door prizes, so if you all filled out your participant uh, profile, I'd like Vanna White to collect those for us, because it's from those profiles that you have an opportunity to win a door prize. <laughs> Ah, some people came in late and didn't fill theirs in. Ha uh ha. -huh. Okay, yes. Thank you. That's okay. You're a great helper. I have this opportunity. I just again want to thank our, our wonderful panel here tonight. Um, I know that you're taking time from your family and your evening activities to come educate us, and for that I appreciate your time and, and service to the community.
meet you with a bubbly afterwards. Yes. <laughs> I want to hear all that talk back there. Okay. Our next door prize winner is.